Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast, where we interview successful athletes in an effort to make you faster. We learn from them and everything that they do, so then hopefully all of us can be a bit more successful on the bike, whether that's in mountain biking, road cycling, triathlon, everything else. And we have a triathlete with us today, Zach Josie from Utah. How are you doing, Zach? I'm good. How are you? Doing well, man. Doing well. So we are going to get into... Here are the, the highlights, I guess, with this one. We are going to get into how you got into triathlon. We'll also get into your experiences of dealing with dwarfism uh, because you're a person with dwarfism and going through the multi-sport process of refining that whole process. And then we'll also go into just how you fit in training and everything else with your schedule. Uh, so I guess first things first, Zach, um, where are you from and what do you do for work? What's your family situation like for context? Okay, I'm from uh, Salt Lake, Utah, Salt Lake City, just a suburb out of Salt Lake. Um, I work, my dad owns a construction company. We do residential foundations, so I'm pouring concrete and that type of fun stuff. And then I live, just me and my wife, we got married about four years ago, and we, just the two of us so far, so... Awesome. So is that, uh, is it hard work, like physical labor outside sort of stuff? Yeah. So I, I run one of the, I'm like me and my dad run one of our crews together. And so we're out doing the physical stuff and setting up foundations every day and then pouring, pouring concrete. So yeah, it's, it's pretty physical. Yeah. That must be tough with training. I guess we'll kind of jump around really quick. Where do you fit in your training with a schedule like that? Cause typically construction work starts early in the day. Yeah. So I, I start usually around between six and seven. And so I, I wake up, my alarm goes off at three every morning and I try to get my hardest workout in before work. Wow. And then if I have a double workout, I try to do the, um, the easier workout after work. Holy cow. It's kind of the the deal I made with my wife when she's when she signed up to signed on to let me do these longer triathlons. It was I had to do the harder stuff in the morning, so I was a little more present at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's got to be super tough doing a hard workout. I can't. I mean, waking up that early, doing a hard workout, having a, a job that's physically demanding out in the elements, everything else, and then coming back for more. Yeah, yeah. So luckily, I try not to do a double workout every day. And I mean, a lot of times, the hard workout in the morning is a bike and then a a run right after. So, so then I don't have anything after work. But usually, if there's a swim, that's after work. And, and, and stuff like or like an easy 30 minute shake out the leg run. Wow. Holy cow. Was that hard to do at first? What do you do to make yourself get up at three in the morning and and do it? I slowly just, when I started to get more um, dedicated to like a a structured plan, I just realized that like I'm I'm already waking up early to eat breakfast and I just, I would wake up at like five anyway and just kind of like sit around and then eat breakfast and leave. So I just slowly started making myself get up earlier and earlier. Like, turned into 4.30 and I tried to do something before work and then turned into four. Then what, as the workouts progressed and got harder and harder, I realized it had to be earlier and earlier to fit them in before work. So just wow. slowly progressed to, to a 3 a.m. wake up. <laughs> That's impressive. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, you can give it a thumbs up right now. If you're listening to it on a podcast, subscribe to the podcast and you don't miss an episode and you can share it with your friends. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about here, Zach, is energy levels throughout the day. How do you maintain, like, a, are you worked going into, or are you exhausted going into work? And um, what do you, how do you manage it? Um, so I always eat a very big breakfast and that comes after I train. And it's usually between like 800 to 1200 calories of breakfast. So, and I know I do that many knowing that like I have a full day of work ahead of me and I've just done a pretty hard workout. And then back up a little bit before my workout, I usually eat a little bit, like a bar of some kind or, or like a piece of bread with, 
toast and jam or bread and honey or something like that to get me started. And then during, I basically fuel every workout as well, just, just cause I know what's coming for the rest of the day. What do you fuel with during your workouts? I do. I really like, um, picky bars. I eat a lot of picky bars. They're, they're delicious. And yeah. So if, if I know it's a really long one, I, I start with that type of a uh, picky bar and then I like um, the the science and sports gels, mm-hmm. and so I use I use mostly those picky bars and science and sports gels. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, when did you uh, stepping back even further? Okay. When did you start to get into triathlon, and like what what caused you to want to do that? So it started. I started. I had this class in my first year of college that was basically a cycling class and it was just kind of like the the typical cycling cycling class where you go to the gym and they shout encouragement at you and you <laughs> pedal as hard as you can it's basically that but I always liked it it was always fun and then I roomed in college with my older brother who was a pretty good runner and he loved running and I just I knew that I I wanted to at least try it a little bit. So I started getting out with him a little bit. And and then I eventually moved home from college and lived with my parents for a little while. And they have a neighbor who was very into triathlon. And I always just kind of asked him a lot of questions about it. And I was always interested. And he encouraged me to try one in Idaho that was pretty easy as far as swimming goes, I had no swimming experience. So he basically just said, this is the one to do. You can float down the snake river. It's 20 minutes, even if you don't know how to swim, cause you just float. That and sounds then, like my, that sounds like my sort of try. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a great one too. I mean, it, I still try to do it every year. It's, it's really fun. And that swim just goes by so fast. <laughs> so I, I still struggle swimming. So I, I love that race. Awesome. Uh, so how'd that race go for you? It went pretty well. I made a goal for myself to finish under three hours. And luckily I had no, uh, I had no concept of what swimming was going to be like. I didn't really, I didn't train properly. Probably I just had some decent fitness cause I already ran and I already biked a little bit. So I had decent fitness. So I just made a goal, just kind of threw up three hours. It was Olympic distance mm. and thought I'll shoot for that. And then, uh, the swim was miserable, just floated, <laughs> floated on my back, um, turned around every now and then and doggy paddled to make sure I was going the right direction. <laughs> eventually I got done swimming and it was like 25 minutes. So that shows I, I had no swimming background on my back dog, how fast the swim actually is there because it's a, uh, like what uh, fifteen hundred meters for an Olympic distance, so mm-hmm. so it was it was quick because of the, the river. And then <laughs> biking, I I had done all my biking on like a a Walmart mountain bike that my little <laughs> brother had at our house. And right before the race, I decided maybe I needed something different, so I borrowed my uncle's road bike, which was like eight sizes too big for me. So, <laughs> So we just like mashed down the seat, turned it, turned the seat downwards. <laughs> just and I just kind of like set up against it and held my pushed myself on back to the seat as I pedaled. <laughs> and, and the bike ride went f- better than I expected. I think I rode the bike ride in around an hour and twenty five minutes. The forty k. Nice. So, I mean, on a big bike. Yeah, no experience. I I was happy with that, for sure. Yeah, and then, and then the run, the running's always since I uh, started running, and kind of that kind of took over my like what I liked. I like I started out cycling, but running kind of took over as my favorite, mm-hmm. and um, so I was pretty comfortable running, and I'd never ran off the bike before, but I still <laughs> felt, I still felt pretty comfortable. And I ran, I think I ran like a, 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 almost like a 50 minute 10 K, which I was fine with off, off no experience. 
experience in a bike. So, and For then sure. I, my total my total time came into right around two hours and forty five minutes. So goal met. I, my goal was met, and yeah, it was a it was a fun race. So uh, let's step backward, I guess, even further. Okay. Um, uh, so let's get into the details of, of, of being a person with dwarfism, specifically in your case. Um, what are your proportions that, that made it challenging or, or I guess qualify you as, as a person that, that has dwarfism? Okay, so mine is, and I'm not, as, as I mean, the more, the more common form of dwarfism you see, is, that's not what I have. I have a different form called Ellis Van Crevel, and I'm not exactly sure the exact differences between the two. I know that stature wise, I, I, I'm a little bit taller, mm -hmm. so I, I'm five feet, but I know the, the, um, the biggest, uh, I guess you'd say, um, physical issue that you can, that you can notice and see is that like the more common forms of dwarfism, I have very short limbs. So I have this, I have this nor this average sized torso sitting on legs that are uh, very below average. And then my arms, especially from my elbow to my hands are very short as well. Mm. And so, but I would say as far as difficulties in running and biking and swimming, that the legs are the mm. biggest, the short limb legs it's, are the biggest hard or the hardest thing to, to work around. What was that like getting into a sport where that, you know, that that's so relatively uncommon and like, like, was that, were you used to like barriers standing in the way with athletics? So you just like, it, it didn't seem different to you or, cause I mean, looking at bike proportions just alone right there, it's really yeah. complex. I mean, or I, I would assume that it is, was that difficult? As far as the, the equipment goes, I, I had no idea that I didn't fit on stuff. I just kind of like, even at the gym and when I do cycling classes, I just knew, I like I went in there and mashed the seat down as far as it would go and just kind of like reached. And sometimes I'd sit like on the bar, the top tube, and just not think anything of it. It's just, I just always knew like, oh, I'm short. So I have to sit on this a different way. And so, and then playing sports growing up, I, I played basketball pretty competitively until high school when everyone hit their growth spurts. <laughs> and then that was just always, it was the same. Like I just knew I was short and eventually I found ways around it. And so, and, and then with triathlon, it was the same thing. I just, the first bike I bought, I just kind of typed in small, smallest bikes I could find. And then, um, I bought a bike from a, a lady that was the, the smallest one I had ever heard of and just kind of mm -hmm. rode that for a couple of years until, yeah. So just kind of like for, for a long time, I had no idea that I didn't fit on these things. Right. What sort of modification modifications did you have to make to that first bike that you got? And what size was that bike? That bike was a, it was a 48 centimeter frame. And then it was like a, I don't know how to explain it because it, it, it wasn't like your common road bike, but it also wasn't a, a strict tri bike either. It was like somewhere in, in between. It, it looks more like a road bike compared to my current bike now. Mm -hmm. And then I think the lady just had like, she had um, tri specific handlebars put onto it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. So, and then it had, <clears throat> so it was a 48 centimeter frame. And then I had to cut, I had to cut this, the seat post so that it, I could smash it down all the way. So it sat flush with the, with the top tube. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it had that we put, um, 650 C wheels on it mm -hmm. so that I could get over my legs over the bike. Mm hmm and then just those are most of the modifications I made and then just push the seat as forward as, as it would go even kind of like like kind of so it like I even had it in a position that it wasn't like you can tell it wasn't meant to be in that position but we just kind of <laughs> like locked it in there 
Yeah. <laughs> found ways to like block it in. So uh, yeah, just, what about stem length? Did you end up changing that at all? Um, on my first bike, yeah. I, I didn't know. Yeah. What about now? What are you on now? And, and what's the, what, what are all the changes that you've made to your bike? Oh, okay. So now I'm on a, a 45 centimeter Cervelo P5 and I believe it's the last year they made, it's the model that's the last year they made a 45 centimeter. Mm. So currently they don't, don't make those anymore. Mm. And then I stuck with the 650 C wheels cause that's what that mo- frame came with. Mm-hmm. And then as far as like the, this, the seat, that's just the same situation. Just, we put it down as far as, as my fitter could get it. And then, and then I, I guess the biggest issue with the new bike is it came with, um, the crank, the crank arms came 170 millimeters, mm. which is way too big. And he immediately, that was his first we're going to have to deal with these crank arms. We're going to probably have to get you a whole new crank because, <laughs> because I don't think that this company makes crank arms that small. And mm-hmm. so he did a lot of research and found a, a Cobb crank set that goes down to 140 millimeters. And that was awesome. the first, that's the first thing he put on. Was that a huge change? I assume oh, yeah. like pedaling the bike that had to have been massive. Oh yeah. It was, it was huge. It, I it opened my, Stunt like I can breathe better now sitting on the bike. I'm not as like, I'm not as curved as I was. I had to like curve over. And so now I'm like, but my back's like really flat now, which is, mm. which has been great. And then pedaling is, it was, I had no idea that I was <laughs> pedaling in a huge whirlwind compared to what I am now. It's really quick, <laughs> faster pedals and so much easier. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what about stem length on this one? My my torso is is pretty average size. My mm. to compare it, my bike fitter was I think he he was five nine, and he mm. said my torso was the same as his, mm. um, with or lengthwise. Right. And so so he had to like extend the stem out, if that makes sense. Yeah. But then then shorten it down. Yeah, drop the stack, but keep the reach long. Yeah, kept the reach long, drop the stack, and then, yeah, so that was tricky. We played with that for like two good hours. On so to get uh, to give people a point of reference, you are you're 152 centimeters tall. That's what five foot is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that, and then the proportions are what make the bike fit unique. Did you have to change the extension length at all, uh, from your pads to the end of the extensions? So, so he, he made the, the elbow pads cause from my elbow to my shoulder is pretty, I mean, it's not, it's a little smaller than average, but it's not where it's short at. It's not the noticeable part. So he kept, he had to like extend the pads out a little bit, but then shorten the, the bars. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. So I didn't have to get new bars. He just kind of like stuck them in a little further. Yeah. So yeah. So my, my forearms would, would fit on there better. Hmm. That's uh, so that's like, uh, I, I assume once you got a bike that fit properly, it had to have been awesome. Because, I mean, that would be really hard. I'm, I fall, I'm so spoiled. I fall directly like within the average proportions and size on things. So I've never had to like, think of this. So yeah, this is like a whole different barrier that, uh, I just personally thinking about this, it would be tough to go up against that just because training is hard enough, especially when you're doing it at 3am. Yeah. Uh, but training's hard enough, <laughs> let alone having to go through all that. And and it's funny. I, I never believed anybody that said, go see a fitter, go see. If... I was doing these, these, uh, hat, uh, half distance, uh, races like 70.3 races. And I would get so uncomfortable at like hour fifth hour and an hour and 50 minutes. I started just every time. So uncomfortable. I couldn't sit on my bike anymore. And my knees started to hurt all the time. And I just, I had no idea. I just I hope this isn't what it's going to be like forever. And finally the, the neighbor that got me into triathlon convinced me like, go see a fitter, go see a fitter. And so I looked around and the local tri club pointed me in, into the direction of this guy. They said that he'll take it personal if you can't 
fit you onto this bike. And so <laughs> I went to him and it was, it was all day. And he finally got me into a really, really comfortable position. So, yeah. but I mean, he said for reference, he said that his normal try fittings are like three hours. Mm. And I think I was there for at least, I was there for at least five. Wow. Trying to get into position. So it was getting your money's worth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went back two more times too. So that's awesome. Uh, what about on the swimming side of things? Uh, did you have to make any adjustments there, whether it's in terms of equipment or technique? Yeah. So, so equipment was tricky. It, it's been really hard to find a wetsuit that fits. I, I like, cause my torso is big. So the top half of my body is like a small, but mm -hmm. then my arms are short. So the small is too long and then my legs are too short. And so I have to squeeze into an extra small from all the, from all the different companies. And then I kind of, um, let blue 70 know one time that I was having some issues and I needed a new wetsuit. And I was just kind of emailing them general questions. Like I have these issues, these issues. And they, they actually did a lot for me. They just, they, they told me where it was okay to be like tight and what would hold me back and just what to expect being in the extra small wetsuit. And so even though, I mean, their, their wetsuit is very comfortable that I currently have, but even though it's still the generic, no huge modifications made on it, they, they talked me through it and kind of like gave me some, some ideas of like how far to pull it up and, and whatnot. So what modifications it, have you done to it or, or even just in how you put it on, how is it different? So I just, I basically, I mean, I guess this is kind of general for everybody. They just shove it up as high as they can get it. And then you work from there. And I just like with my arms and stuff, I know that I have to, um, that I'm going to have a little bit of drag because it's going to bunch up and in, in certain places. And so like, I just basically, I let it go over my hand as mm. long as I can bend my fingers. And so it doesn't bunch up and I, so I don't get drag from bunches everywhere. And then I kind of let it, it comes right off the heel of my foot. So it doesn't go completely over my ankle or it doesn't completely up above my ankle. It stays below that a little bit. And then just kind of not too many, not really any modifications to the, to the suit itself. Mm. But, and I know they do offer some custom ones. So that's, that's probably down the line. Yeah. That's the next step when you're doing yeah. St. George and knocking that one out. Yeah. Um, how about running? Uh, any adjustments that you, you know, you mentioned that that was like the thing that you really liked. Was it, uh, do you face any unique challenges with that, whether it be technique or equipment? So yeah, with, with running, I, like I said, I, at the beginning, I had no idea that I needed to make adjustments. I just kind of always got out and ran. And then you start reading things as you get into this type of stuff and you're, your cadence should be this fast. Your cadence should be this fast. And I found that my natural cadence was a lot faster than they suggested. Mm. And I just think that came with my legs being short. And then after my first Ironman 70.3 in St. George, the really, really hard uh, run. You start out and go just for four miles. It's almost completely uphill. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I, I thought like, I've never ran this bad before. I don't, I didn't know what to do. And so asking around, I just, ever since then, I've, I would say 90% of my runs are, are hill based. Everything's on a hill. Mm. Every, even my, my quicker stuff, like I put the incline on the treadmill a little bit. And so just trying to strengthen my legs mm. for that. And I think, I mean, it makes sense that my legs are carrying a uh, average size torso and so having stronger legs can carry me a lot quicker, I think. So, yeah, that's an interesting concept. Most people, cause the, the size of your legs, that's also going to be proportionate to the, to the size of the muscles, right? Yeah. On your legs. Yeah. So then, you know, if you're, there are smaller muscles having to work as hard as a normal, uh, yeah. length basically to carry that torso. 
Yeah, so, and I just knew, I mean, it makes sense that everyone suggested doing hill running because that's, I mean, that's strength-based running, I guess you'd call it. And so I almost all my running is that type of running. Uh, and what's your typical cadence when you run to give people kind of like an idea versus maybe what it might have been otherwise? It's usually, so, I mean, you read all the stuff that says like 175 to 180 is what like the good runners run and mine's more like 185 to 195 mm-hmm. depending on what type of work I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's really quick turnover and did you have to train yourself to do that or was that natural? What I, th- um, naturally I was already pretty high, but then once I learned why I needed to be quicker, then I started to train mm-hmm. a little quicker as well. And yeah. so I would say that naturally I was, I was around 180, 185. And then when I, when I was told to run with a little higher cadence because of my leg size, then I got up a little bit higher. So was that just like a make the switch run fast? Was that fatiguing at first? Was it yeah. difficult? Yeah. I don't know. Um, anyone who, did, who who has done cadence training probably knows that it's hard to, I know that like can cause your heart rate to go up pretty quick. Even if you're running a certain pace and you're just mm-hmm. making your legs move quicker, it's, Cause your heart. So it, it took a while and it's still, it's still a process now that I'm trying to keep my heart rate down as my cadence goes up, but my speed stays the same. So it's mm-hmm. thinking of all these things at once is, is also exhausting. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. Um, okay. So let's get into your progression through try a little bit. Uh, we okay. talked about the, the first try you did where, uh, is the triathlon that I'm going to try to convince my co-host on the ask a cycling coach podcast do, cause then I can float down a river. So that sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, from there, uh, what, what hooked you and what made you keep going and want to get into doing longer distance, you know, stuff like 70.3s. So that first, I just, I just had so fun at that race. It was everyone, uh, the tri community for the, for the most part, I'd say 98% of the tri community, at least at the, at the, my level is really nice. Everyone's, everyone's congratulations and good job and keep going the whole race. And that race was, was no different. And I just loved it. And everyone would like, get the finish line, just a lot of like camaraderie and everyone hugging each other and congratulating each other. It was a really good, really fun experience. And I was hooked. I, I loved it. And so that summer, I think I did like three more local Olympic distance races, unfortunately not aided by the river. So, <laughs> so they were all a little bit longer. And then, um, so the, and then the next year kind of just did the same thing. A lot of local races. And then that year, or the third year, I was married. It was my first year married doing the the races. And I remember I remember having doing the race and driving home. My wife was driving, and I just told her, I'm like, I didn't run good. I biked really. I started to get a little more serious about it. I, I know I can bike faster than that. And I was so discouraged. And I told her, I'm never doing this again. I'm like, I'm just gonna stick to this this one race i'm not doing it anymore and in in the three hour drive home from idaho she had talked me into not only continuing with triathlon but signing up for swimming lessons and uh registering for st george 70.3 all on that three hour ride (laughs) i had all but quit she's a good motivator (laughs) yeah she is she was she she just kept saying well why don't you why don't you uh call your friend and see if he knows someone that can teach you how to swim. And I pouted for a minute and then about 20 minutes, she talked me into that. So we, st- that started, that <laughs> process started. And then she goes, um, I think that you're going to need a more reliable bike. So why don't we buy you a new bike this, this winter? And that kind of got me cheered up a little bit. And then she, <laughs> she said, I know you've talked about doing that race in St. George. How would that be? And I just, well, it's, it's a half day. And I told her the distance and she goes, well, I think you can do it. Let's sign you up. And so by the time I, by the time we pulled into the garage, I was signed up for 
uh, bi-weekly swimming lessons and the St. George 70.3 race. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did you prep for that? You mentioned the swimming lessons. What did you learn in the swimming lessons that helped you get faster? So the, I, like I walked in there and the guy just, the, the coach that taught me how to swim just kind of like looked me up and down. He goes, get in, let's see, let's see how you swim now. And I got in and just kind of like swam for a second and I'd stand up and catch my breath and then I'd swim again. I wouldn't pull my head up to breathe. I just kind of like kept it down. And he just, that first lesson, he just goes, well, we, we got to teach you how to breathe before I can do anything. So we just, we worked on really basic stuff that I remember uh, my swimming teacher teaching me as like a little kid, like breathing through a little ring and mm -hmm. pulling my head up and then going under him pushing out the air and coming back up. We basically did that for 45 minutes. And mm -hmm. I just, I remember thinking like, Oh, this is silly. I'm not going to learn how to swim like this. And then, <laughs> then I went again and he started teaching me how to use those breathing techniques while I'm actually swimming. And then it kind of clicked pretty quick in that second, in that second uh, lesson. And then from there he, um, he basically just emphasized that most of my swimming, if I'm going to get faster, had to be from my core and my torso and my hips, that my legs and my arms probably weren't going to do me much, much good and slow me down with anything. How do you swim more with that? Because everybody thinks like, or I shouldn't say everybody. I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll be this person. I totally, in my mind, like the power comes from the arms and the legs. Yeah. So how does the power come from the torso and, and core? And so, yeah, he, he would just, he would pull up these videos and show me like, watch him. And he, it was, um, it was one of those Olympic swimmers and he, he could just watch him, watch him, how he twists in the water. And he basically just showed me that like when you like moving your shoulders and your hips back and forth at like a certain, like a 45, 50 degree angle, just kind of like turning side to side because that's, that's where your, most of your power is going to come from. And so I started doing these drills where I put on flippers and I wouldn't use my arms. I just kind of like flutter kick and then move my torso side to side. Hmm. And for, I would say for about a month, that's all I did. You just have me do that. And then I think, I don't know if he, if he did this on purpose, but that actually taught me how to breathe quicker as well, how to get the breathing down because I would, I mean, my stroke was so bad anyway that I would like kind of bring my whole body out of the water to take a side breath and then plop back in. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of, so with that, that like swimming drill that he's having me do every day basically taught me how to breathe and use my, my hips and my, my core to power myself through the water a little bit better. Wow. So, wow. which I mean, I think from the videos he shows me, he always says like, look, you don't like these guys use their legs cause they're Olympic swimmers, but really their core is what's pushing them through. He's like, I just need to teach you how to do that a little bit stronger. So you don't rely on your legs and arms. And so basically he just like convinced me that's how I needed to do it and then taught me how to do it. So, wow. Uh, was there anything else that you learned with swimming, uh, from that, from that process? Um, basically just, and then just the normal stuff like speed work, like why that was important. And then why practicing like open water technique was important, like siding. So he taught me those things as well, but, but I'd say at least, for, I mean, any swimmer is, is better off probably learning, probably doing some of uh, those drills where you're really emphasizing your core and your hips. But, but that, I would say that was the biggest thing for me. Mm. It was really like a, a month of that specifically was, was really, and just really drilling it into my, my memory and my, my training. So how much faster did you get as a result of that? Like, what, like, where are you at now with your swimming compared to where you started? So I would say I started not being able to finish a 100 
without coming up for to like doggy paddle or without mm-hmm. stopping at, at one end of the pool. And now and then I would say now, well before <laughs> the virus and everything, mm-hmm. I just barely started swimming again. So but before the virus I was down to like one minute and thirty second one hundreds. Mm-hmm. Which I mean I, I can't brag about that, but but for for, for my for my body I I never thought I would do do that fast. So Yeah, there's no way I could do that fast, man. <laughs> that's like that's a, that's a ton of improvement and that, and that's i mean that's not like a, i don't hold that the whole swim that's more of just like that's when i'm doing speed 100s and that's mm-hmm. also why i say i can't necessarily brag about it because um most people are much quicker but but for me it was it was that and swimming probably is is the one that i feel most accomplished about i i didn't think that i would be able to swim ever so i'm most proud of that that feat i'd say is learning how to swim that's awesome man what is so much improvement it's like uh and i'm sure that that then made everything else easier as well yeah. like you know like for the rest of the other disciplines that's the thing with triathlon if yeah you can get faster at the at the earlier disciplines and it just makes it easier the everything that follows oh yeah for sure that's and that, I mean, like we talked about my bike fit, the same with that made, made everything, it's making everything easier. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's certainly the case with swimming as well. Um, I guess getting into, to St. George, you know, how did that go in your, you trained for it, you prep for it. Um, or I guess actually probably even before then, how do you use, uh, how do you train on the bike and, and how do you use trainer road? Cause I think that you have like a coach, but you still use trainer road, correct? Yeah. So, so currently I just put, um, those, those workouts into trainer road or what I like to do because I like the trainer road structure so much is that I find the workout that's basically the same, the same, uh, idea and use the trainer road version mm-hmm. of it because I just, I like the structure that trainer road has. And I like, I like that. Like I like watching that screen instead of other screens. And I like the, the coach Chad's stuff at the bottom and it mm-hmm. keeps me motivated. So, so that's what I'm currently doing. And it's actually, to be honest, it's not far as far as the cycling goes. It's not that different from like the mid level, uh, mm-hmm. half distance plan it's mm-hmm. i'd say it's it's about the same amount of biking hours and structured very similar mm-hmm. to what that is so uh how did saint george go for you saint george went saint george went uh really good so to get to train for saint george that's when i, I actually was just looking through podcasts and i I saw the Ask a Cycling po- Coach podcast, and I thought, "Oh, this this will be all right." So I started listening to it, and I had no, I didn't even know what an indoor trainer was at the time. <laughs> I was just doing everything outside and started talking about that. And I, I think within a week, I had bought an indoor trainer, and it was a it was the Kurt Kinetic Inride with the Inride thing on the back, mm-hmm. and th- so that's how I started training for St. George was after happening upon your podcast and and setting up more of a structured plan and just just doing one of your plans and um yeah and actually actually one thing on that really quick we should probably go into your improvement on the bike too because you talked about the swim yeah but um because your first ftp test i think it was in the fall of 2017 right yeah uh, 20 minute test yeah um 220 is where you started and yeah then, r- roughly 220 it might have been Little high, I don't know. Two, we'll say two twenty. I think that's what it was. Cool. Um, and then how high did you, or what was your improvement like that first year in using it? In the so by the end of two thousand eighteen, I had done St. George and um, Indian Wells, and by the time I had got to Indian Wells, I was I was training at uh, an FTP of two forty, I believe. Awesome way to go. So, I improved between 15 and 20 watts. And then 
for St. George, I think I was training at about 230, 235-ish at that time. So just in those couple of months, I'd, I'd made a, a lot of improvement. So how'd race day go? Uh, this is 2018 St. George. How'd it go? It was, I, well, I'll start the day before because I went and did the, the practice swim and I, that scared me so bad. I got <laughs> in the lake and I froze and the water was cold. I couldn't breathe. And, uh, that same, that same friend that had gotten me into triathlon kind of went down to St. George to, to mentor me through the race. And so he took me out swimming and he just, he stayed with me the whole time while we were practice swimming saying, just breathe, just do what you, you know how to swim. I don't know why you're panicking. He's like, just breathe, just do what you learned. <laughs> and so we were out there for maybe 20 minutes and came back and I, I was, um, kind of a wreck <laughs> <laughs> and then I just the next day he he kind of stayed by me while I was in the swimming shoe and he was by the fence and he just just kept saying it's easy look the pros are already done look the first people are already done it's not going to be as long as you think and then then I got in the water and like as I was leaving he goes he goes you're going to do it in under uh, 50 minutes which I kept telling him I was going to do it in an hour Mm-hmm. And he goes, you'll do it in under 50 minutes. That's the last thing he said to me. And then I started swimming and my first two breaths, I was a little out of breath. And I just like, I don't know what happened. I just finally just focused and swam normal and started getting a rhythm going. And I think, I think I ended up swimming the first swim in like 48 minutes. Wow. Way to go. So, and I had planned on an hour. So that was there, I, I was pretty relieved when I got out and saw that my Garmin said 48 minutes. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's no, um, I mean, I'm no pro, but it was, for me, it was a big, big uh, accomplishment doing that. Oh, for sure. Season. And then, um, um, I don't know how familiar you are with that St. George uh, bike ride, but it is, there's a climb, right? <laughs> right at the end up the canyon and it is a brutal crime climb especially after uh like the first thing you do is come out and do a like a pretty hard climb and then it flattens out as you're going through one of the smaller cities and then you do another sort of small climb into saint george and that also flattens out and then you go through like the the back part of St. George and then turn around and then you come up to the snow Canyon park and that snow Canyon climb is, is so hard. And it was, mm-hmm. it's like the last, I think you hit it at like mile 40. Mm-hmm. So, so you've already gone 40 miles and then you have to do this climb. I think it took me, I think it was the actual climb itself is maybe five, five miles. It, it, mm took me almost 30 minutes to, mm-hmm. to climb that but but it was it's it was it was good though because i was as i was climbing it there was a lot of people i was passing that were walking their bikes mm-hmm. and so i felt encouraged that like oh man i'm glad i don't don't have to walk walk my bike i'm glad i'm strong enough to get up the this climb by myself and then finally you get to the top and then it's just a really easy uh glide back down into the to the finish line on the bike. And I, I, I am, I think that last, I don't know how many miles it is, but it's very, it's another five miles, five or six miles. And it took me like nine minutes to do that last couple of miles. It was just such a downhill. Yeah. How'd you run off the bike? And then I ran, like I said earlier, it's that, that monster hill. And that, that kind of took, took me out of it. Early, I started stopping at every aid station to walk through them. I I ran, I ran between the aid stations, though, so I was proud of that. But every aid station, mm-hmm. I walked, I stopped and walked, got a sure. drink, had to have a little pep talk with myself. And I think I ended up running about it was eight minute. I averaged eight minute twenty second miles. Wow, nice job for that first one. So, and then I, my overall time was six hours and and five ish minutes way to go that's so, awesome yeah it was it was that was right my goal was six hours so i was happy with 
with that. I thought I'd bike a little quicker, but I also didn't, uh, I also underestimated all the climbing that you do in St. George. So for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this just shows, I think like, uh, the cool part about triathlon in particular, the culture is kind of accepting of this, that yeah. there are different measures of, of success yes. in the sense that like each person is improving and racing against themselves. And yeah. yes, there are a few that race against, you know, the, the fastest of the fast, but it's not really like cycling where it's like all for one because that all for one mentality is like win or lose and that's it. Yeah. In this case, it's about improvement. So that's like, I mean, look at like, look at the improvement that you had going from doing spud man that, that one yeah. in the very beginning and floating down the river on your back to then going to doing St. George in six hours. Like that's, that's seriously impressive, man. Way to go. Uh, it's Thank just, super yeah, cool. it was, it was very, um, it was very confidence building for me, but I, 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 found a lot of confidence in myself during the race even. And, and, um, yeah, just, just stuff that I never thought I could do. I never even thought my body would last that long mm. doing that kind of stuff. So it was, it was very, very confidence boosting for me. What would you say to people that, uh, are facing obstacles and that might stand in their way, maybe unique to them, maybe not be unique, but, facing obstacles that stand in the way of your goals. What have you learned about that whole process? I just learned, I guess that f for me, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very stubborn and I've learned how to be stubborn to get over these obstacles. And that's so basically like, I'm just, I just know that like, okay, I can do this. I can do it faster than some of these people. I know I can. And it's, it's very, it's a stubborn attitude. And the more that like people, people like i mean you get looks and stuff being sure you bring in like this probably the smallest bike in the in the race and people look over their shoulder a little bit i know no one's there's not many that have been intentionally mean but you still get a little bit you still get looked at a little bit and i just it just for me it's just being stubborn is is one thing i tell people you just be stubborn just no matter what you can do it it's i mean I can do it. There's people with far, far more things that hold them back than I have far. I don't want to say worse things, but physical things that probably hold them back even more than hold me back. So, I mean, I, I would, I would think that they feel the same. If, if we all can do it, then hmm. there's, there's no reason nobody else can. What's your net, what's your big goal now moving forward? My big goal, I want to, I want to do a full, I was training for the St. George turn to a full this year. So that was my, my big goal this year. So I'd like to, I'd like to compete in a full, um, which now is looking like it's going to be Coeur d'Alene next year. Cause that will switch to a full next year. So I'd like to do that if I can <laughs> awesome. see, see how well I'll hold up on a five, six hour bike ride instead of just a two and a half hour bike ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. How cool. Well, um, Zach, thank you for coming on and thank uh, you for, for sharing your experiences. Hopefully we've, we can learn something from the swimming, from the bike fit, from all the different things. And thanks for using trainer road. Thanks for, oh, yeah. for being an example and an inspiration for us. It's pretty awesome. So yeah, thank you guys for all you do. It's, it's very, I mean, it's the, it's probably some of the uh, best free information you could find in, in, <laughs> as far, as far as endurance sports goes. And I, I mean that too. It's, it's, it's been very helpful. Happy to do it. Happy to do it, man. Well, thanks. And uh, if anybody wants to follow you or get in touch with you or anything else, uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, probably on my Instagram. It's, it's, uh, czar, but Z A R 1232. Uh, the 1232 is a reference to, uh, John Stockton and Carl Malone. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So czar 1232, um, and then just Zachary Josie on Facebook and Twitter is, is the same, I think. Awesome. Cool. So, 
Well, thanks, Zach. Uh, we'll be in touch and, and keep us keep us up to date on your plans and how everything will go. Maybe jump into the Trainer Road Forum and let us know how everything goes for Coeur d'Alene. That'll be exciting. Awesome. Definitely. Cool. Thank All you. All right, Zach. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. See you later. See ya.